In this video we're going to talk about scalars and vectors. We'll cover some vector operations and then we'll go into this idea of the system and the surroundings. And we'll apply some of those concepts to two different problems. One of them having to do with a hockey puck and the other having to do with a circular path. Let's start by going over scalars versus vectors. A scalar quantity does not have direction. It only has magnitude. If you look at some of these examples, you probably would recognize temperature, distance, you know, energy, time. These are things that you don't usually associate with having a direction. And so one of those formulas would be average speed. And so if you're traveling on the highway, for example, you're going 50 miles per hour, let's say. 50 miles is a distance. Per hour is a time. And so we're familiar with this concept that speed is distance over time. Also note that an average is over a time interval where an instantaneous measurement is at a particular point in time. And so when we say average, we're talking about the entire interval. A vector adds this idea of a direction. So you have a magnitude, which can be the length of the arrow that you can draw, and then the direction is indicated as well. You can notate this by using bold font or an arrow above. And so some of these examples, we have displacement instead of distance, we have velocity instead of speed, you have other things like force and torque. And these things have direction associated with them. And so another example that's common would be position vectors. And so position vectors are defined from an origin. So pick a point to be your origin. And then let's say we start at point A. And so that's our initial point. And so we have RI for our initial position vector. And then we have RF for our final position vector. And then if we look at this red arrow, that represents the displacement. And so we have this triangle symbol delta, which means change. So you have final minus initial. And we use that to indicate displacement. So that's going to be bringing up another formula here. So it's very similar to the first one. Average velocity is displacement over time. But displacement is a vector and distance is not. And same thing with this velocity. Velocity is a vector and speed is not. And so even though these formulas look very similar, they're not quite the same. So real quick example, if you were to travel five meters to the right and then travel five meters to the left, your distance would be 10 meters, but your displacement would be zero because you're back at the same point that you started. So even though it's a subtle difference, it's actually very important. Now we can go on to an idea of a matrix. So you can see how it's pretty similar here, but it's kind of an extension of a vector. And you might have heard of it a matrix before. We kind of build up to this idea of a tensor too. It's kind of outside of the scope of what we want to learn about, but I just want to show you here that a tensor is analogous to a vector, it's just more generalized. And so if we, if we kind of see the, the point of these vectors, we can build up to these complicated ideas like Einstein's general theory of relativity. And so this is one of his famous equations. And it looks kind of complicated, but the, the essence of it is that you have this tensor which represents the curvature of space. And then you also have on the right side one that represents the distribution of mass and energy. And then those things are pretty much equal, but you just got to throw in these constants here, like 8 pi, and then the gravitational constant, and then the speed of light. And so these concepts build up to very important ideas in physics. Let's go over vector operations, starting with addition. Now addition, you're going to add one vector, let's say A here, to another vector B. We're going to take the tip of vector A and line it up with the tail of vector B. And we'll produce this result A plus B, starting from the tail of A and ending at the tip of B. And so a cool thing to note here is that A plus B is the same as B plus A. It doesn't really matter how you add them together. You're going to produce the same result. Another thing to note, remember, is that tip to tail method when you're adding them and this idea of superposition where when you 
uh, have a vector, you can kind of move it around in space as long as you don't change the magnitude or the direction. Another operation here is subtraction. It's very similar to addition. We're going to take a and b, but this time we're going to flip b around. So we're doing a minus b, which can be viewed as a plus a negative b. And so if we take b and flip it by 180, we get that negative b, and then we can pretty much do addition from there. So subtraction is very similar to addition. Next thing we got to talk about is components for sure. This idea of components is important, especially when you're looking at a vector that's not lined up with your coordinate system, or if you have components and you're trying to form a result. Either way, this idea of components is important. So if we look at this 8, which is the x component of this first vector, and then we look at 26, which is the x component of that second vector. Add them together to get 34 for the total. We also look at this 13 and 7 for the y components. We can add those together to get a total y component of 20. And so we end up with this final vector here, a, which we can write as having an x, a y, and a z component. x component being 34, y component being 20, and z component being 0, which is just that dimension that's coming into and out of the screen, which we tend to ignore for simplicity. The Pythagorean theorem is very important. I'm sure you remember it has to do with the right triangle. When you take side a and you extend it out into a square, it forms a square with area a squared. And you do the same thing to side b. We have a square with area b squared. We do the same thing with the hypotenuse, and we have a square with area c squared. And we say that the area a squared plus the area b squared is equal to the area c squared. It's a wonderful theorem in mathematics that allows us to calculate the magnitude. So for example, here we have 34 squared plus 20 squared, and we take the square root of the whole thing. And we get that the length, the magnitude, right, of this a vector is pretty much 39.45. But remember, it's a vector, so that's just the magnitude. We also have to consider the direction. And for that, a lot of times, we have to use trig. And so trig, a lot of times, is having to do with these right triangles as well. And we remember SOHCAHTOA for basic trig. SOHCAHTOA standing for sine being opposite over hypotenuse, cosine being adjacent over hypotenuse and tangent being opposite over adjacent. And so a lot of times what we do is we use the components, the xy components, to give us information about the hypotenuse. And so in that case we would use tangent. And when we're trying to find an angle we have to use arctangent or tan negative 1. And so to find this angle right here of this final right triangle that we made, we'd have to do tan negative 1 of y over x. And so we would do tan negative 1 of the 20 over 34. And we end up with an angle here of 30.47 approximately. That gives you kind of a crash course on components and why they're important. Another thing is unit vectors. And so when we have a unit vector, it's really just a simple way of giving us a direction. And so vectors that have a magnitude of 1 pretty much are called these unit vectors. They don't affect the magnitude really because they have a magnitude of one. They're just giving you a direction so we notate them with a hat and so common ones are going to be x hat or i hat um, for the x-axis and then the y-axis is y hat or j hat the z-axis is z hat or or k hat and so notice how it has a magnitude of one but you, we could multiply by any number that we want and what that would do is just extend that particular direction and so the unit vector is just a way that we can get a direction and then we can multiply it um, to extend the magnitude okay so a dot product or a scalar product is another thing that we can do we won't focus too much on this right now but the basic idea is when you have a vector a and b if we have this projection of a onto b it's pretty much a cosine theta that's basically giving you uh, what a dot product is visually. And so when we take uh, the vector a and we dot product with the vector b, we get the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of theta. Notice how that is a scalar, so you're producing something that does not really have a, di a direction. The other way to get that is by taking the x components, ax and bx, multiplying them and then adding them to the, the ay times by. And so two ways to get that. The other thing to note that we won't cover all that much right now at least is the cross or vector product and that's going to produce a vector.
And the way that we do that is we take A and B, or your vectors, and if we cross them, you're actually going to produce a third vector. And it's going to be called A cross B. And that third vector is going to be perpendicular, 90 degrees, to the initial two. So you're kind of going into a third dimension here. And the magnitude of that um, cross product is going to be represented as the area of this parallelogram here. So uh, the formula that we can look at here is A cross B equals the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. In this case, not cosine, but sine theta. And we also have a unit vector here indicating that we do have a direction. So we do want to add that direction in for the vector product. Finally, let's cover the idea of a system and the surroundings. So a system is really anything that you define to be the system. So it's a set of parts that come together to make a whole. And then anything outside of that system is called the surroundings or environment. And so a lot of times we're talking about energy entering or leaving the system or matter entering or leaving the system. Another thing that we can talk about is viewing an object as a system and looking at the interactions on that object. And so in this case, let's assume that I'm pushing this object to the right, but let's say it's not going anywhere. Okay, so that must mean that there's no net force. And so that doesn't mean there's no interactions. It does not mean that there's no forces. So we actually have four here that we could consider. We have an applied force to the right. We would have friction counteracting me. We would also have this idea that the object would be falling through the floor if it wasn't for the floor pushing up on the object. So we have this contact or normal force upward. And then we have gravity, which behaves like a force pulling down. Okay, so we can classify these systems because the idea of a system is so broad. We can classify it into social or physical um, and physical systems that you can see uh, over here, mechanical, optical, and electrical. Um, but social systems are kind of interesting too. Uh, we could look at uh, natural and human made. And so some of these examples here, we could have a natural physical system being a solar system, right? Uh, or a natural social system being a bee colony or a wolf pack. Uh, we can also look at a human made physical system like a hydraulic system or a human made social system like you know the education system. So we're mainly focused on physical systems. And when we're dealing with matter and energy, we can also classify it as isolated, closed, or opened. And so when we look at this physical system, if you're isolated, uh, imagine that the energy and matter, none of that can get in. If you're closed, the energy can get in, but the matter cannot. And then if you're open, the energy and matter can get in. And so you could look at that idea also socially and imagine that you're stranded in the desert and that would basically be you're isolated. And then if you're closed, it'd be like an invite only party. And then if you're an o open social system would be like a public library. And so that's the basic idea of a system, what it is and the surroundings, which is everything outside of the system. Let's apply these concepts to some problems here. We'll look at two different problems. The first one being a hockey puck sliding on a smooth surface of ice in a skating rink. If you're not familiar with hockey, it's a sport that pretty much the goal is to use these um, sticks to hit this hockey puck into two different nets on either side to score points. And so let's assume that this hockey puck was already set into motion. And uh, we have some equally spaced times here T0, T1, T2, T3, and T4. This X, Y, and unseen Z axis represents spatial measurements. And so it says that each of these markings here are one meter apart. And um, we have different parts of this problem here. We'll go through one at a time. Okay, the first part of this problem here wants you to list all the um, objects in the, in the puck's surroundings that interact significantly with it. So pretty much list all of the interactions with the, the puck. And so if you think about this puck traveling that was already set into motion, um, we can start to think about the different forces, the different interactions on it. And if you think for a minute, you'll realize that, well, there's definitely some gravitational force that behaves as a force that's pulling downward. If it wasn't for the ice, it would just go right through the ice. And so we must have a counterbalance here so that uh, these vertical forces are balanced out. There's no net force. And so we have this normal force or contact force from the ice pushing upward. 
But then if you realize that, let's say it's moving to the right, because it's moving, it, it, there's also potentially resistance to that motion. So we can call that friction. And it's kind of coming from two different sources potentially. So we have um, the air particles that it's colliding with. So we could consider the aerodynamic drag. And then we also want to consider the friction uh, between the ice and the puck itself. And so I would definitely be familiar with all four of those interactions here with the puck as it's traveling. Now the second part of this problem wants you to kind of draw arrows and wants you to practice drawing vectors and so in this case it wants you to draw the arrow representing the position vector r1 and it uh, it also wants you to look at these other position vectors now remember position vectors are drawn from the origin and so uh, when we draw this position vector r1 r2 r3 it's just literally an arrow from the origin to whatever point you're interested in whatever position you're interested in and so now we kind of understand how we could apply um, the idea of a position vector to these problems. But we also have some displacement. And so we want to potentially draw these displacement vectors as well. And in this case, uh, for this second part here, um, we want to look at uh, the displacement vector um, 2, 1. So we're looking at 2 as our final position and 1 as our initial position. And so the way we would draw that is just literally just draw an arrow from your position 1 to your position 2. Now that is a displacement uh, vector, not a position vector. And so notice how we're starting from our initial position and ending at our final position. We also have this triangle symbol which indicates that change. Uh, and a lot of times the notation uh, is subscripted to 1 representing that 2 is the final position and 1 is the initial position. And so we can do another version of that problem, and we could look at the displacement vector from uh, 2 to 3, and we pretty much have the same thing here. So we have a arrow drawn from 2 to 3, and that is how we would represent that. All right, so let's move on to the third part of this problem. And so uh, we're looking at the components of the puck's position vectors at times t1, t2, and t3. And so the position vectors, remember, go from the origin to the, the puck. And so we want to know those components. Now, clearly, it's not directed. These None of these position vectors are directed along your axis. So you, have, you want to break it up into the, the components that, um, that kind of fall on the axis. It'd be nice if we could just draw the x-axis right through <laughs> where our motion is, and then we wouldn't have to consider it. But that's not how this problem is designed. So we're going to look at, uh, in this case, negative one half would be our component uh, for this this first position vector. You see how we have to go over negative one half, and then we got to go up up a positive one half. And so that would give you one example. Um, and so you can kind of see it right here. Negative 0.5 is your x component of that r1, and then we go out, got to go up 0.5, and then you can throw in a zero for all these as well because the the zero is representing that z-axis, which is coming into and out of the page. And so you kind of go through each one, and don't forget the meters because that's the unit that we're considering here. Let's look at the fourth part of this problem now. So here we're looking at the intervals 1 to 2 and 2 to 3, and they're saying that those intervals are 2 seconds apart. So each interval from 0 to 1, from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, from 3 to 4, we're pretty much saying that, okay, those are equally spaced at 2 seconds uh, intervals. And so we want to know the components of the average velocity. We want to think back to that equation, velocity is displacement over time. And so we want to break this up into kind of two problems. One, we're looking at uh, the 1 to 2 here. And then the other part, we're going to look at 2 to 3. And so when we look at the displacement vector from 1 to 2, um, one way we can think about this is we can think about going over to the right 1 and then up um, 1 half. Okay? And the other way to think about that is um, we have 0.5 and then minus a negative 0.5. It's still going to get you to the 1 here. Um, so you can either kind of do it visually or you can actually do the math of your position vectors. But either way, you're going to have a x component of your displacement vector uh, being 1. And then you can do the same thing. Um, you have 1 minus 0.5. still going to get you to that 0.5y component of your displacement vector. So. Either way is fine. Just don't forget to divide by two seconds. And then we also have those units of meters per second. And we end up with a final component 
uh, here of our velocity of 0.5 in the x, 0.25 in the y, and then 0 in the z. Notice how you can also do that for the other part here from 2 to 3. Now just visually you can kind of determine that you're going to go over to the right one and then up one half again. Or you can do the math here. You get the same, it's the same thing. Uh, and then we're going to divide that by two seconds. You're going to get the same answer pretty much, which kind of makes sense. That's indicating that uh, we have the same um, velocity situation happening uh, from one to two and then also from two to three. Let's move on to the fifth part. So we're kind of conceptually describing this now. And so it says in this physical situation, how do you think the puck's average velocity vector for the interval uh, here from one to two compares to the puck's instantaneous velocity at times t1, t2, and t3? Um, so the instantaneous being at t1, at t2, and at t3, how do you compare that to the average velocity from um, 1 to 2? Uh, so we kind of already proved that the average velocity from 1 to 2 is the same as from 2 to 3. Okay, so those averages are equal. That's kind of telling us that the velocity is not changing. Um, so the friction that we talked about is not really significant. And so if we have a, a pretty much constant velocity, you don't really have a, an acceleration here. So we can potentially assume here that, that we have our instantaneous velocities, in this case, equal to our averages. And so during that whole four second interval, we pretty much have our instantaneous velocities along that entire four second interval equal to the average velocities. Uh, so that's kind of how you answer that question. And then the last part, six, we can, what can you conclude from your answers to part four and five about uh, the interactions? Um, looking at Newton's first law of motion, which is pretty much saying, you know, um, something in motion is going to stay in motion and something at rest is going to stay at rest unless acted upon by some external force. And so we have something that's in motion. It's going to stay in motion and, and it's going to pretty much stay um, the way that it was was going and how fast it was going unless it's acted upon by some force. And so what can we conclude? We can conclude that these interactions um, don't really matter much. They're not really significant. So it's at a constant speed. We know that the friction is pretty much insignificant. We know that the earth and the contact between um, the ice um, giving that normal force that pretty much cancels itself out. So no pretty much overall interaction that's really affecting this motion all that much during this interval. Now, if you were to let this hockey puck go, you know, 100 meters, um, then you might start to see those effects of friction uh, become more significant, right? So let's move on to the next problem here. Problem two has to do with a vehicle traveling in a circle. I'd like to think about it as a traffic circle. That's one application of this. And so we have a vehicle traveling along from A to B at a constant speed of 4 meters per second. And then miraculously, it instantly speeds up to 8 meters per second, which is unrealistic, but just kind of go with it. Um, from B to C, it's going to be a constant speed of 8 meters per second. Again, we have this mysterious instantaneous acceleration here that um, this kind of uh, violates physics, but it's okay for now for this theoretical problem. Uh, from C to D, we're going to have 12 meters per second uh, constant speed. And so imagine that we have this radius of 50 meters and we're traveling kind of around this traffic circle or at least three quarters of the way around it. And the question is, uh, what is the average speed of the vehicle traveling from A to D? So if we consider A to B, B to C, and C to D, pretty much that whole thing there, and we want it the speed, okay? So we don't necessarily want the velocity. There's a difference here. So this problem really tests your knowledge here of those two formulas that we discussed earlier and the differences between a scalar and a vector. And so here we're just really looking at the scalar version of the problem. And so we have the formula uh, average speed is total distance over total time. And we can rearrange that formula. Time is distance over speed. So that'll be important for us. 
And then we can also look at the circumference. So the circumference of the entire circle, which is the distance around the edge of the circle all the way around, is 2 pi times the radius. So that's a formula to remember. And then when we go to actually calculate this problem, we can look at the formula total distance over total time. And then for the times for each section, we can look at the velocities of each section because they're traveling at different velocities, right? And so we know that the total distance is going to be the circumference, so 2 pi times 50. But we've got to multiply it by 3 fourths because we're only going 3 quarters of the way around. So that gives us the top. And then for the total time, we break it up into those three sections. And we know that there will be a different amount of time for each. So, right? Because if it's going faster, it's going to take less time. So we have to do three different additions here, uh, taking into account the different uh, speeds. Um, but for each one, it's a quarter, right? So for each one, you're going around a quarter of the circle, uh, and then you're dividing by your speed in order to get your times. And so when you work out that math, you should get about 6.5 meters per second for your average speed from A to D. And remember, we're talking about speed, not velocity. So this next part, we're looking at velocity. We're not looking at A to D, though. We're looking at A to B. So we're just looking at one section here. We're traveling four meters per second uh, during that time from A to B. But we want to know what the average velocity is um, from A to B. And so it's a little bit of a tricky question, but you've got to look at the vectors here. And so imagine that we have a position vector A. Um, so RA, remember, going from the origin to, to A, and then RB going from the origin to B. Um, and then we have this displacement vector here. Um, going from A to B. And uh, I drew in the negative RA here just to kind of show you that um, we're actually flipping over um, in order to form our component triangle. We're flipping over the position RA into negative RA in order to get our components of that displacement vector. And we could also look at the angle there too. It's not necessarily asking us for that, but we could. All right, so let's kind of work our way through this. And we know that the time um, measurement here from, from A to B uh, is potentially going to be important for us. We want to know how, how long it took to get from A to B. And so simply we take the distance, which again we know is a quarter of the circumference, divided by the 4 meters per second that it's traveling. And then we have the time that it takes to get from A to B. Um, that'll be one thing that we want to do first, and that's about 19.6 seconds it took to get from A to B in that circle. But now we really can, we, we really look at the vectors now, and so we're looking at the displacement, not the distance around the edge of the circle, but the displacement. And so that one is going to be uh, the position vector B minus A. Uh, and again, the reason why it's minus, I kind of showed you conceptually how that has to flip in order to work. Uh, and so that's why we do B minus A visually at least. And then, you know, you kind of just look and say, okay, well, uh, for B, uh, what's the X component of B? Well, zero, right? And then what's the Y component? One. Um, and then what's the Z component? Zero. And when I say one for the Y component, uh, you still got to multiply it by the 50 for the radius. The key idea here is that RB is only uh, having a Y component, and RA only has a um, an x component of negative 50. So you got a negative 1 and then you can multiply it by that 50. When you work out that math though, you basically have 50 times the component 1, 1, 0. And so we look at this displacement vector. We know it has a component 1, 1, and then 0. We obviously have to multiply by that 52 because of the radius. But that's the idea there for our displacement vector. And we could look at the magnitude of that displacement if we want, and we can use the Pythagorean theorem. And we end up with uh, 50 square root 2, which is 70.7 meters, would be the magnitude of that. So now we can look at the average velocity. We have the total displacement here in the component form uh, with a magnitude of approximately 70.7. We got that displacement on the top divided by the time that we found to be about 19.6 seconds. We do that math and we end up with an answer looking like this, which to me doesn't really tell me very much. Looking at that quickly doesn't really help me very much. So I'm going to go the extra step 
and kind of look at what that means. And so uh, we have an average velocity. Again, we can calculate the magnitude of that um, to be 3.6 meters per second. And then we can look at the uh, angle here to be 45 degrees, which is, is kind of straightforward here. We kind of knew that that angle would be 45 degrees. Um, and so that would be how you would figure out the second problem here. And I hope that these two problems kind of illustrated some of the foundational concepts that we discussed in the beginning. We'll see you in the next one.